Oh, wow. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. So much excitement. I know it's the Fed chair meeting, right? I know. I know. I know. I know. Yeah, Bloomberg. Bloomberg. These, uh, I mean, yeah. Forget about me. I know. It's not about me. <laughs> okay. So today, on the final day of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, I'm excited to welcome some special guests to the briefing room today, Pop Phenoms BTS. Woohoo! Woo While many of you may know BTS as Grammy nominated international icons, they also play an important role as youth ambassadors, promoting a message of respect and positivity. After this briefing, they will join President Biden in a discussion about Asian inclusion, representation, and diversity, as well as addressing an anti-Asian hate crimes and discrimination. As many of you know, the president has led a historic whole of government approach to combat racism, xenophobia, and tolerance intolerance facing ANHPI communities. Beginning his first week in office when he issued a presidential memorandum leveraging the power of the federal government to stand against this hate. The president also signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law, signed an executive order to reestablish the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and funded critical research to prevent and address xenophobia against AA and NHPI communities. So without further ado, I will, I will let the, the the band take it from here. They're going to each speak. Uh, we have an a, a interpreter somewhere here. There you go. Good to see you. Um, so they'll each speak first, and then the interpreter will come back up and interpret what they just said. They're not going to take any questions. They're just going to come here and, and give, some, give some, um, some words, and then we'll start the briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Karine, for your kind words. And hi, we're BTS. And it is a great honor to be invited to the White House today to discuss the important issues of anti-Asian hate crimes, Asian inclusion, and diversity. 네, 오늘은 AA NHPI Heritage Month의 마지막 날입니다. 어, 저희는 AA NHPI 커뮤니티와 뜻을 함께하고 기념하기 위해 오늘 백악관에 왔습니다. 네, 어, 최근 아시아계를 대상으로 한 많은 증거 범죄에 굉장히 놀랍고 또 마음이 안 좋았는데요. 어, 이런 일이 근절되는데 조금이라도 도움이 되고자 오늘 이 자리를 빌어 목소리를 내고자 합니다. 네, 오늘 저희가 이 자리에 올수 있었던 것은 저희의 음악을 사랑해 주시는 다양한 국적, 언어, 문화를 가진 되게 팬, 아미 여러분들이 계셨기에 이 자리에 올수 있었다고 생각합니다. 정말 감사합니다. 네, 한국인의 음악이 서로 다른 언어와 문화를 넘어서 어, 전 세계 많은 분들께 닿을 수 있다는 게 아직까지도 좀 신기하고 어, 근데 신기한 것 같습니다. 그리고 이 모든 걸 연결을 시켜주는 음악이란 건좀 참으로 훌륭한 매개체가 아닌가 싶습니다. 어, 나와 다르다고 어, 그것은 잘못된 일이 아닙니다. 옳고 그름이 아닌 다름을 인정하는 것으로부터 평등은 시작된다고 생각합니다. 네, 우리는 모두의 각자의 역사를 가지고 있습니다. 오늘 한 사람 한 사람이 의미 있는 존재로서 서로 존중하고 이해하기 위한 또한 걸음이 되기를 바랍니다. And lastly, we thank President Biden and the White House for giving this important opportunity to speak about the important causes remind ourselves of what we can do as artists. Once again, thank you very much. I'll provide an interpretation in Korean and English. 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 I'll provide an interpretation in Korean we joined the White House to stand with the AANHPI community and to celebrate. Jimmy said we were devastated by the recent surge of hate crimes, including Asian American hate crimes. To put a stop on this and support the cause, we'd like to take this opportunity to voice ourselves once again. Jayob said we are here today thanks to our army, our fans worldwide, who have different nationalities and cultures and use different languages. 
we are truly and always grateful. Jungkook said, we still feel surprised that music created by South Korean artists reaches so many people around the world, transcending languages and cultural barriers. We believe music is always an amazing and wonderful unifier of all things. Shiga said, it's not wrong to be different. I think equality begins when we open up and embrace all of our differences. V said, everyone has their own history. We hope today is one step forward to respecting and understanding each and every one as a valuable person. 마지막으로 남준 씨가 마지막으로 중요한 문제에 대해 함께 이야기하고 우리가 아티스트로서 무엇을 할수 있는지 생각할 기회를 만들어 주신 바이든 대통령님과 백악관에 감사드립니다. 감사합니다. What does it mean to you to come to the White House? We're going to go. We're going to go. We're not, they're not going to take any questions, but thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Oh. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, I don't know how you're gonna. Okay. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I'm excited to hear what Brian has to say. Okay. Um. Next up, we have Brian Dees, our uh, National Economic Council, the Director of National Economic Council, who just came out of uh, the meeting with the President and the Fed Chair and Secretary Yellen. And so he is joining us today. So thank you, Brian, for making the time. OK. <laughs> so I get to go home and tell my kids that BTS opened for me. <laughs> Uh, I did not expect that when I woke up this morning. Um, uh, and I, I, I know that you're all here to uh, talk about trimmed mean inflation, and you're ex as excited about that as you are uh, for them. So uh, thank you for hanging in here. Um, so uh, I just wanted to uh, provide a little bit of context to uh, the uh, economic focus uh, of the day. Uh, as you all know, the president just concluded a uh, meeting with Chair Powell, uh, along with uh, Secretary Yellen uh, and myself. Uh, it was a very constructive uh, meeting uh, focused on the outlook for the U.S. and the global economy. Um, and I, I won't go into detail of the private meeting other than to reinforce that the president underscored to Chair Powell uh, in the meeting uh, what he has underscored. Uh, consistently, including today, uh, that he respects the independence of the Federal Reserve and will provide uh, the Federal Reserve this space and the independence uh, that it needs uh, to tackle uh, inflation. Um, also today, uh, the President published an uh, op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, um, and I uh, will just give you a, a, a little bit of context for uh, that piece. Uh, and how we are uh, thinking about economic priorities here. Uh, so four quick points. Uh, the first point is uh, there is no question that the global economy right now faces a range of uh, significant challenges. Um, inflation is uh, first among them. Uh, it is a global challenge. We learned, for example, today that inflation uh, in the euro area uh, hit an annual rate of 8.1%. Uh, and it is a challenge that the President understands uh, is hitting American families uh, and, and creating anxiety and also uh, economic hardship. Uh, as he said, he gets this. Um, the second point is that as the, as the President is making fighting inflation his, uh, his top economic priority, um, it is really important that we recognize that uh, we can uh, take on inflation from a position of relative economic strength. Um, that is true if we look in the global context. Few countries are better positioned than the United States um, to make this transition and navigate this transition that the President talked about today um, from historically strong recovery to more stable, resilient uh, growth. Uh, if you look, uh, the reason why we have those economic strengths is the strength of our recovery, the historically unique strength of our recovery. 
Uh, at the center of that is the labor market. Uh, you all know the statistics. I won't uh, belabor them, but suffice it to say, we have the strongest uh, labor market uh, in modern history, uh, which is not only creating job opportunities, opportunities to move into new, um, uh, new careers with high, uh, better pay for millions of Americans, but it all is also pulling more people into the labor force. And in fact, we've seen the most, the rapid, most rapid labor force uh, participation rebound among prime age workers of any of the last four recoveries. Um, and we're also seeing that in terms of the strength of uh, household balance sheets as well. Uh, savings is up, uh, debt is down, bankruptcy filings uh, remain near pre-pandemic lows, uh, eviction filings are 30% below their pre-pandemic levels. All of these are sources of economic strength from which we can now focus on uh, bringing prices down. The third point, uh, this was an important piece of this, which is that uh, the president's talking about this transition and growth uh, as we move through this transition, our economic growth should look different than it, uh, uh, it has in the historic recovery phase. Um, we have, we've run this first uh, leg of the race at a very rapid clip. Um, that has put us in this strong position uh, relative to our peers. Uh, but this is a marathon and we have to uh, move and shift to uh, stable, resilient growth. Um, and that's why the president's outlining the plan um, uh, that uh, he wrote about today, uh, which is something that he has been focused on here for some time now. Um, core to that, uh, are the three elements that he flagged. The first is uh, nominating quality people to the Federal Reserve. He has done that. He got an opportunity to speak with Chair Powell today. A uh, strong, uh, incredibly credentialed bipartisan group. Uh, and we are uh, hopeful that the, uh, that the Senate will move to confirm the last uh, of his nominees, Michael Barr, without delay. And giving the Fed the independence to operate, um, which is critically important, particularly at a moment where inflation is elevated. Uh, but cannot be uh, taken for granted, which is why the president is reinforcing it publicly uh, today. Uh, second is lowering costs, how can we, we make things more affordable for typical families during this transition period? Uh, and the third is lowering the federal deficit, which will uh, help to ease price pressures in the economy. Um, that is, um, on those second and third, that is the focus, uh, the president's economic focus, the focus of our economic team. Many things, uh, many of the steps therein are things that we can do uh, on our own with executive action. There are also places where we need uh, Congress's help uh, and to work uh, with Congress. Uh, but that is our uh, overarching focus uh, when it comes to the economy right now. So that is uh, the context I want to provide. Happy to do whatever Kareem tells me to do. Uh, Brian. One thing that may, one trade-off to cutting or finding inflation may be a, a change in the unemployment levels. What level of increase in unemployment the White House see is acceptable in order to obtain lower inflation? Well, I think that one of the, one of the things about this transition, uh, and we are in this transition, one of the things about having the strength of the labor market recovery that we have had uh, to date um, is that we are uniquely well positioned to actually move toward more, uh, more stable uh, labor market uh, gains or, or gains more, more consistent with periods where we have had this level uh, of, of unemployment in the past. Um, and uh, we, can, we can actually take on inflation without having to sacrifice uh, all, of those, uh, all of those gains. Uh, and so you see that, for example, in um, the, uh, the high rate of available jobs per, uh, uh, per worker. Um, that can, um, and you've seen that start to moderate uh, somewhat. Um, so one of the ways that, for example, businesses can uh, reduce uh, reduce their demand, uh, if if that is necessary, is to is to bring down the number of uh, of open jobs they have available. Um, but uh, that is, you know, I think that the the bottom line is we have an, a very strong uh, labor market. And that is not only a source of strength for millions of people who are getting jobs or getting jobs at higher wages, it has helped to uh, strengthen household and family balance sheets as well. So part of the reason why we have seen savings elevated and we have seen credit card payments and other debt service uh, payments come down to historically low levels is because of the strength 
of uh, the uh, the labor market. So that positions us relatively, you know, relatively well going into this period of transition. Just one follow up. He, the president emphasized, and you just emphasized, his respect for the Fed's independence. Is he happy with what the Fed is doing? Uh, consistent with respecting their independence is respecting their independence. So uh, what I would say is that he is. Um, uh, he has confidence in the, the people that he um, has nominated. Uh, he is grateful to the Senate to confirming uh, four of his five nominees. Uh, and he is, uh, uh, he is focused on actually giving them the space to make those independent judgments. It certainly is the case that the President has identified inflation as his top economic priority. Um, and he, um, he agrees with the assessment uh, that, the, that the, the team at the Federal Reserve is making and that, uh, that Chair Powell is making as well. Uh, but that, but part of providing that uh, uh, independence is to uh, is to stay out of the business of commenting on tactics, timing, or otherwise on the monetary policy side. So you can expect that from us going forward. Okay, okay. Let's follow on that. If he's confident in the team that he's put there, is he confident that they will be able to deal with this enormous challenge, which is taming inflation and not putting the economy into a recession? Well, I think that what what we are uh, what the president is and what we are very confident in is that we can approach this challenge and we can focus our efforts on bringing inflation down without having to sacrifice all of the economic gains that we've made because of the unique position of strength that we are in. Because of the progress that we have made uh, over the course of the last 15 months, we are now uniquely well positioned to do that. Does the President think that the Fed needs to revise or review its modeling and forecasting techniques given they pretty badly misjudged that inflation was not actually transitory? That falls squarely into the category of things that we will, uh, we will leave to uh, the independent judgment of, uh, of the Fed. Thank you, sir. Uh, you noted that inflation remains the President's top priority. I'm wondering a little bit about the intersection of that priority and the President's plan to forgive um, as much as $10,000 in student debt relief for families making as much as you know, 300000 uh, some uh, analysis says that this would cost taxpayers as much as $250 billion, and of course that money's not going to be dumped into the economy all at once, but I'm curious how you see this affecting consumer spending because presumably some of these folks, rather than servicing their loans, might go buy a new phone or decide to buy that car or go on the vacation. So are, are you confident that that student debt relief program uh, would not have a negative impact on inflation? Yeah, so I'd say a couple of things of that. The first is that um, con notwithstanding some of the reporting, uh, uh, the President hasn't made any decision on that policy, and so I don't get ahead of any decision or any, any particular program or plan uh, uh, that has been uh, speculated about. Broadly speaking, uh, if you look at uh, those who, uh, who hold student debt, um, the, principally people who went to public colleges, principally people who when they were uh, uh, going to college had uh, two-thirds of which uh, their family income was less than uh, $50,000 per year, uh, and, uh, and many of whom are uh, struggling uh, economically in a, in a position of having to uh, repay that debt. When you look at the question of the, the macro, macroeconomic impact, I would say two things. One is it is a function of a number of those uh, policy uh, design parameters, including um, the repayment. So, t so today there is a moratorium on uh, repayment of student loans, and so uh, the um, the resumption of payments uh, would interact with any potential debt cancellation uh, from a, from a macroeconomic perspective. Number one, and number two, if you look at the impact of almost any proposal, because of the the point that you made, notwithstanding the the uh, the the cost of any uh, any proposal is uh, the, the, the economic impact of any proposal would be o across the course of years or a couple of decades. Uh, and so the impact on uh, inflation in the near term is likely to be um, uh, is likely to be quite small. But again, because the president hasn't made any decision and we're not talking about a specific plan, I won't speculate specifically, but I think most of the analysis suggests that the near term impact would be pretty small. As, as you're putting together sort of this outreach today with the op-ed, with the message uh, that you and other colleagues have been putting out there, is implicit in that sort of acknowledgement that you have not been telling the story of uh, the economic picture in a way that has been satisfactory to the President? 
I think what this underscores is actually a ongoing commitment by the president to both uh, train his focus on uh, what is the, the most important thing for the economy and to communicate that as well. So I would you know, uh, point you back to the President's State of the Union, where the President said that my priority is lowering costs uh, and lowering the deficit. And I think what, what this President uh, has tried to do in every stage uh, in this historic and unique economic recovery is to effectively communicate to the American people where we are to give it to people straight, uh, but also to lay out clearly his plans, his priorities, uh, in terms of what he uh, wants to see done. And so we are, uh, we are now moving into uh, a, a phase which is really a transition, that transition that he spoke about. And so what he um, has been doing for the last uh, uh, couple of weeks, uh, what he will continue to do is try to help make sure that we're communicating clearly to the American people um, what that means uh, and also what his plans are, uh, and also that he is prepared to work with anybody, Democrat and Republican, to try to make progress on that, but also highlight that there are differences uh, between his approach and others, and that's important for the American people to understand as well. So what is the expectation today as you advise the president or his expectation about how long prices will be in at, at these high levels, 40-year levels, how long inflation will be here? Well, uh, I, you know, the, there, are, there's, there is uncertainty, and uh, I will leave the predictions to forecasters. I think you and others have seen most major forecasters out there in their projections, most projecting that um, we will see moderation uh, in, uh, in inflation over the course uh, of the year. What I can say and, and, and is important with respect to, uh, for example, the op-ed that the President wrote today is that the President has a clear approach. Uh, and priorities with respect to tackling inflation. And the more progress that we can make on that plan, the more progress that we can make in lowering costs and making things more affordable for families right now, the more progress we can make in building on the historic deficit reduction we've already seen this year, uh, then the, the better off we'll be, the better positioned we'll be to actually see that uh, moderation happen more quickly. So that's our focus. Our focus when we're thinking about policy particularly fiscal policy, is how can we make more progress on that front, understanding that, you know, um, there, are, uh, uh, there are a lot of predictions out there. Just a couple more, Chair. Hey, thanks, Brian. Uh, Chair Powell has said there are limited tools that the Fed has to deal with supply shocks, like what we saw from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the lockdowns in China over the coronavirus. Given that limitation, do you believe the U.S. is well insulated and protected against future supply shocks that could cause prices to rise, as we've seen with gasoline? Or do you think additional action is needed with Congress in order to provide that protection? Well, I would say a couple of things. The first, uh, the, the first point that I made and underscored is we do face serious global challenges uh, right now. And the supply chain disruptions, the ongoing supply chain disruptions emanating from COVID and, and, uh, and China uh, most recently um, are uh, significant. Uh, likewise, the energy, uh, the implications on the energy market of Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, are significant uh, and on, on ongoing. And so, uh, so absolutely, those are uh, significant global challenges. Uh, they are affecting, uh, they are affecting energy prices and food prices globally. Uh, they are affecting supply chain distribution systems globally. Uh, that is point one. Uh, point two is, we in the United States are better positioned to actually navigate through those challenges than almost any other country, uh, in part because of the, as I've said already, the strength of our economic recovery, in part also because of the work that we have done, for example, on the supply chain side over the last nine months of consistent, focused effort working with all different parts of our supply chain. We now see, for example, the fluidity, what's known as, you know, the, how fast uh, you know, container, uh, containers can move through ports, for example, and get from a ship all the way to the end, that we are, have seen significant improvements in that fluidity across time, which puts us in a better position to navigate uh, potential uh, new supply uh, shocks, but they, uh, they pose on, on ongoing challenges. Third, there are places where we could absolutely use Congress's help, um, and we could use it urgently. And so when you think about the, some of the core challenges we have respect, with respect to supply chains, they circle back to the issue of semiconductors. And we remain 
extremely vulnerable to the supply chain fragilities associated with semiconductors. Notwithstanding everything we have been through in this pandemic crisis, we still don't have a dedicated supply chain strat uh, office within the federal government uh, that is funded adequately to actually uh, take on MAP and, uh, and aggressively go at these challenges. Now, we've made historic progress notwithstanding that, but we uh, could use Congress moving to provide the resources and the funding and the authorities uh, that are in the bipartisan innovation bill that is now in conference. Uh, so that's, a, uh, that's one place where we are hopeful, working very closely uh, with, uh, with Congress in an effort to try to get that done. And that would give us more tools uh, to keep building our resilience to these types of global shocks. Thank you. Since, since you were in the meeting, can you say whether the president expressed any view about what the Fed's path is right now? Chair Powell has talked about 50 basis points each in the next two meetings. Did President Biden weigh in at all on whether he thinks the Fed needs to go faster, slower, just about right at all in the meeting? So I'm not going to read out any uh, specific components of the meeting other than to underscore that the president did in, uh, in private, as he did in public, underscore that his, his commitment to giving the Fed the space to conduct monetary policy independently without political interference. Do you think that the Fed has moved too slowly? By saying it's their responsibility, they're, the implication, of course, is that they're, they're holding the bag to the fact that inflation is at the, the highs that it is at. I think by saying it's their responsibility, what the President is doing is acknowledging and underscoring the, uh, the pivotal role that the Fed plays institutionally and that monetary policy plays in uh, the process of uh, bringing uh, bringing prices down. That's the that's a core mandate that the the Fed has, and that he respects not only respects but is willing to underwrite that the that independence matters, and being uh, insulated from political interference matters. Uh, that's not that's not an approach uh, that uh, that uh, the previous president took to this issue. Uh, it has not been an approach that presidents in the past have taken, and this president has underscored and is underscoring that he will uh, he will do that. And I think that that's what you should take away from uh, from his uh, his acknowledgement of the responsibility that the Fed has. And the tariff reviews come up at all, or can you give us the latest on that? The recalls, of course, that easing tariffs on imports from particular countries could be one measure that would cool inflation here in the U.S. Yeah. I know it's an issue in discussion. I don't have any um, update uh, to share today. Following up on Josh's uh, question on tariffs, is there any timing you can give us on a decision specifically on the China tariffs? Not nothing, uh, nothing specific on, on tariffs today. I wanted to ask you about budget reconciliation. Um, about the what? Budget reconciliation. What do you view as the right revenue to spending ratio to combat inflation? Well, I think what the 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 president um, has has said um, and is underscoring today is that we have a real opportunity to lower costs and lower the deficit, uh, and that we can actually do those two things together in a way that will create a uh, more competitive uh, economic environment and actually increase incentives for businesses to invest in the United States by pairing tax reform with uh, measures to lower costs for families. So I, I'm not going to get into the, 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 the specifics of the conversations around reconciliation other than to say the President really does believe that the right approach here is to focus on measures that would lower costs and help to make things more affordable right now for families uh, and to lower the deficit. Uh, and that uh, he believes that that's the right way to address uh, uh, inflation, and that, that's probably the most significant thing that Congress could do right now to actually help to accelerate the process of bringing uh, prices down to Kelly's point. Last question. Uh, about a year ago, you stood here at the podium along with other officials talking about inflation as transitory. Um, now a lot of the focus from the, the White House and the broader administration is on messaging, as, as Caitlin and Kelly pointed out earlier. Was it a mistake to use that phrasing, and do you think it gave Americans a false sense of how long these rising prices would, would be here for? Look, I think that this has been a, um, an uncertain and unexpected and, uh, and uh, uh, recovery period, uh, historic uh, in in many ways. And so I think that our focus right now is on what is the right policy uh, to bring prices down without sacrificing all of the economic gains that we have made. 
And I think that one thing that is, um, is unambiguously the case is that over the course of this 15 months, the strength of this recovery that we have had in the United States uh, has not only helped millions of people uh, and millions of families across the country, but now positions us well uh, to address uh, what is a global issue. And when you look out across the world right now, there's also no question that uh, inflation is a global challenge. Uh, the 8.1 percent figure that I cited for the euro area, if you look back over the last six months, uh, headline euro area inflation is 9 uh, percent. And that is because we know that principally the drivers of that are the convulsions and the convulsive impact of having to shut the economy down and restart the economy. Uh, and uh, compounded now by the supply effects that Josh asked about with respect to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. So that's our focus. That's where we're focused now. Um, and we think that uh, the policy choices that we make here going forward will be consequential in uh, how quickly and effectively we can navigate through this next period. But that's not just about mostly about the structural factors. I, I guess when you talk to Americans, when you look at polling, they say their biggest concern uh, is rising prices, which I think part of that stems from the prolonged period that we've been in. And so I'm wondering, as you focus on the messaging, do you, ha, have you learned lessons from, from that where you discussed it as transitory and now, you know, 15 months later, we're still here? Look, I think that the, the, what the president has done uh, with respect to communications has been, is been to consistently uh, explain to the American people where we are and where we need to go. Uh, and that continues to be uh, the way that, uh, that he approaches this issue, and very much from the perspective of what it feels like to sit around a dining room table or a, a kitchen table uh, in, uh, in this country, because that is that's his lived experience, and that's the way that he approaches these economic policy questions. And so he understands that right now the top uh, issue on people's minds uh, is the prices, prices at the, uh, the gas station, prices at the grocery store. And he's made very clear, and he's communicating very clearly that that's uh, his uh, top economic priority, and that we can address this from a position of strength, and that we can make this transition to stable growth without sacrificing all of those gains if we make the right decisions going forward. And so that's, uh, that's what he will continue to do. It's certainly what we'll continue to do in serving him. Brian, if I could quickly Brian. follow up. The president is communicating effectively. How do you explain and make sense of his low poll numbers? I will just say this, that, that the president always tasks us to focus on what are the right policy uh, decisions and the right policy choices uh, to try to advance an economy uh, that has been his animating, uh, uh, his, his, his animating feature of what he wants to get done for years, which is how do you build an economy from the bottom up the middle out where working families have more opportunities. We've made historic progress in that direction. Uh, we have made historic progress in that direction because of some of the hard and difficult policy choices that this president uh, has made. Uh, but we now have to address this issue of uh, rising prices. The president has been focused on that. Uh, for uh, some time. We need some help uh, in working with Congress on some of the issues that we just discussed. And uh, I think that, you know, as if we can deliver, I think what the American people are mostly, mostly want to see is that we can actually move the ball forward and that we can actually make some progress in things that matter in their daily lives. And it's why you've seen the president, it's why you've seen the president so focused on things like reducing the cost of internet. Uh, building more affordable housing to reduce the cost of housing because we get that those are practical things that are impacting people in their lives. And the more progress we can make on that front, that, you know, that, that, that pe that's what people want to see. That's what people want to see is progress. And so that's where we're going to keep our focus. Why is the president so hesitant to face us from behind the podium just like you did? Okay. Uh, Thank you all. Thanks, Brian. Bye, Brian. Come back soon. Uh, all right, that's all I have uh, for uh, uh, for the topper. Oh, we could no. Um, go ahead, Josh. Why don't you kick it off? Kick us off here. Great. Thanks. Um, just one sec. Um, two subjects. Mm -hmm. uh, first, could you offer some clarity on what President Biden meant when he said we're not sending Ukraine rocket systems that could strike into Russia, since even short-range missiles could fly over the border if they're fired nearby? And is the White House concerned that sending a rocket system could be considered escalatory? 
So let me first say that the systems, uh, the system, those systems continue to be under consideration, so I don't have anything to preview on anything specific there. But as the President said, uh, we, won't, we won't be sending long-range rockets for use beyond the battlefield in Ukraine, and right, but right now I don't have anything uh, to preview for you today. Um, secondly, could you update us on the status of uh, where Mexico's president stands on going to the Summit of Americas? Uh, it's the first time we posted since 1994, and what does this controversy say about the U.S. relationship with Mexico? So, um, I, again, I don't have anything to share I, or anything to confirm about uh, anyone's attendance. Uh, we don't have a final list. Once we have a final list, we'll be sharing that. Look, you know, the president is looking forward to hosting, uh, as you just said, the first one in a long time. It's the ninth summit uh, of the Americas in June, just a, a few days away, and values the opportunity for a leader to leader, uh, civil society, and private sector engagement to advance our goals and find <laughs> common ground. He views the summit as an important opportunity for leaders and key stakeholders to come together to address uh, the core challenges facing the people of the, of the hemisphere, hemisphere. No other part of the world impacts the security and prosperity of the United States more directly than the Western Hemisphere, and we are, are joined not just by geography, but by also by economic ties, democratic principles, cultural connections, and familial bonds. I, I don't have a list to confirm or uh, any uh, any invites or decisions that's been made. That's up to uh, clearly the, per the individual leaders. Hello. Hello. Um, happy to I feel like it's um, been a long time. Um, I, just to follow up on that, has yeah. everyone who's going to be invited to the summit been invited? Uh, we're still working through some of the invites. We just don't have a final list. And we have said, once we have a final list, we'll share that. Um, can you elaborate on the President's promise earlier today to meet with lawmakers on new gun laws? when or how that would happen and, and whether there are any preconditions on when or how he'd meet with them. So the president is, is look, he's been calling for action for some time. Uh, what we have seen, these, in particular, these past two weeks uh, with these mass shootings in Buffalo, and we saw the president go to Buffalo and, and grieve with the family there. We saw the president just, and the first lady, uh, just this past Sunday go, uh, go to uh, Texas uh, to grieve with the parents there. Um, and it is heart-wrenching what, what uh, we're experiencing. This is an epidemic, the gun violence that we're seeing. Uh, across uh, across the country and we have to do something and we have to we have to continue uh, to make efforts uh, to act to protect our kids to protect uh, people going to the grocery store the president has made this one of his priorities from the first day that he walked in uh, into this in, in, into this administration and now he's calling on Congress to act uh, and so he is is hopeful uh, he wants to make sure there's action um, he, our the the White House, uh, we have our White House team that is in constant communication uh, with Congress on a, an array of issues, including this one, because again, this is a priority. And he wants to, to make, continue to make sure that he continues to voice um, his concern and what, what needs to be done next. Look, the President has done everything that he can um, from, from, from the federal government. We are looking at other executive actions that we can put, po possibly do. Uh, this President has done more executive actions at this point than any other president, uh, but it's not up to him alone. He cannot do this alone. This is what you heard him say to, to Kelly O yesterday. And so Congress needs to act so we can have federal law uh, legislation on the books so we can stop uh, this epidemic that we're seeing across the country. What other executive actions would be under consideration if you just said He's done everything he can do. Well, he, we're looking to see what else can be do, can be done, to be clear. Uh, we have uh, done, uh, as, as you've heard us say, we have done uh, the, the, gun, the ghost guns, the stemming of the flow of ghost guns is something that uh, the President has done through executive action. If you look at ghost guns, uh, it is, uh, they, are not, they are not regulated. Uh, there's no serial uh, number connected to them. They are the weapons of 
choice when it comes to terrorists and uh, and, and criminals. Uh, this is something that uh, that we have seen more and more pop up across the country. And so he put out an executive order uh, through the Department of Justice to make sure that we do everything to stem uh, to stem that to stem ghost guns being out there. Uh, he's done more, taken more efforts to take on gun traffickers uh, and make sure that they help they are held accountable. Uh, he used the American Rescue Plan, which by the way, no Republican voted for, uh, to make sure that we put uh, uh, police officers back in the streets who many of them uh, lost their jobs during the, the COVID pandemic. And so there's $10 billion that we announce that cities have used uh, to make sure that uh, they, are, they are using that funding or said they have used that funding for gun violence. These are the actions that this president has taken. And now he's calling on Congress to take action. He's all calling on Congress to take a vote so that we can protect families and communities. And he said, no, nothing scheduled yet. Nothing scheduled. I don't. I don't have anything more to preview. He said yesterday himself that they are looking at other options on executive actions. But again, he's done more than any president at this time. One other thing I wanted to just clarify: for you, something he said on Friday mm -hmm. uh, during his address at the Naval Academy. The president was born in 1942, graduated from the University of Delaware in 1965. In his address, he said he was appointed to the Naval Academy in 1965. Was he? Was it in 1965? So I, oh, I did not hear that part of the speech, uh, so right I would have to... Okay, I did. I I There's missed. A lot of writing about it. I no, I hear you. I hear you. I have not. I, I need to read it myself and just go back and, and see what you're talking about exactly. I, I can't speak to it right now. Okay. Thank you, Corrine. Canada is making it impossible to buy, sell, transfer, or import handguns anywhere in that country. Would President Biden ever consider a similar restriction on handguns here? So, you know, we'll leave it up to other countries uh, to set their policy on gun ownership. Uh, the president has made his position clear. The United States needs to act, as I just laid out. He supports a ban on sale of assault weapons and high-capacity magazines and expanded background checks to keep guns out of the dangerous hands. He does not support a ban on the sale of all handguns, to answer your question. Okay, thank you. In some places in this country now, a gallon of gas costs more than people on the federal minimum wage are making in an hour. What does the White House want these people to do to stop driving to work? Look, the president understands what it feels like. Um, Deese just spoke, spoke about this. Brian Deese was just here and talked about how he understands what it means for people who are sitting at their kitchen table and see gas prices go up. He understands that feeling personally, or seeing prices uh, of grocery store of grocery uh, groceries go up in the grocery store. This is something that he is uh, inherently aware of, and he is doing everything that he can. As Dees, Brian Dees was just here, uh, um, his economic advisor, uh, one of his top economic advisor, laying out what he is planning to do or continue to do to make sure that we lower costs at the gas pump. He also said, Brian also said that we are dealing with an unprecedented time with global challenges that we have never seen before. And that includes clearly the pandemic, uh, that includes Putin's uh, tax hike that, that we're seeing this past couple of months. Uh, that has had an effect on gasoline gasoline prices. A dollar and fifty cents went up uh, since uh, uh, Putin has amassed uh, his troops on the border of Ukraine. These are real, uh, real, uh, you know, global issues uh, that has led to this moment. But the president is doing everything that he can to make sure that we address this issue. And you just mentioned Putin a few times yep. as a reason for recent inflation. Do you guys think that any part of inflation this year is because of President Biden's spending plans, or is it all Putin's fault? Well, what I can say is we are, and Brian just spoke to this, we are at, at a historic place when it comes to the economy, when it comes to uh, unemployment being at the lowest that we have seen in some time, when it comes to the president creating more jobs in his first term, his first year, than any other president, eight point, more than 8.5 million jobs. Now we're going to a place where it's be, we're going into transition, where we're going to see an economy that's more stable, that's more steady. So that's because of the American Rescue Plan that, we, that the president signed into law, that no Republican 
Lincoln signed or we voted for, I should say. And all of that work that he's done the first year has led us to a place where uh, there are more jobs out there, more jobs are being created, that we are in a place where we're seeing economic growth. Now, and also, as I've stated, this is an unprecedented time with COVID. This is an unprecedented time with the war. And so that, that, that Putin has created and started on Ukraine. And so we have seen, that has shown us uh, since uh, since these past couple of months, since the war, we have seen an uptick on gas prices. So I guess the next question would be, does President Biden take any responsibility for his policies potentially contributing to <coughs> inflation? His policies has helped the economy get back on its feet. That's what his policy has his policies has done. Um, this, when we talk about the gas prices right now, this is indeed Putin's gas hike. This is what we have seen in the most recent months of, of what we've seen at the gas pump. And so that is a fact. We have seen about 60% increase uh, uh, in the past several months and because of uh, the amassing and his invasion of Ukraine. And so the president, his goal right now and what he is frustrated about is what the, peop what the American people have to go through and what they are trying to deal with as they are, as they are, uh, are around their kitchen table. So that is his focus right now. Go ahead. The president has talked about understanding from his life experience those difficulties, economic hardships and so forth. Does he consider it a crisis for American families that prices are at this 40-year high? He, he's, he considered, he understands the hardship that people are going through. He understands how difficult it is for families. He understands that. That's why he has done everything that he can uh, to, and taken steps uh, in many different ways to make sure that we lower cost. Uh, you know, we announce new actions to give farmers the tools and resources they need to boost production and lower food prices and, to, and feed the world. Uh, High-speed internet for tens of millions of Americans. We announce new steps uh, with the private sector to lower those prices. Uh, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office found that the deficit fell uh, by 1.5 trillion this year, and it actually fell even more uh, in most. Is it a problem? Is it a hardship? Is it a crisis? What is it that you people know, are facing? It, it is. We're just in a difficult time right now with this inflation. That's why he's doing everything that he can. Look, his op-ed. He talks about this explicitly about how what he knows the American people are going through, and he laid out what it is that he's going to do uh, to really fight against inflation. Uh, so it, it is something that. He he is aware of. This is clearly, right, as president, is something that is a priority to him. Uh, that's why he made sure that uh, he rallied allies and partners around the world to release one million barrels of oil per day from the tr Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and that has been something that started for six months, in addition to an additional 60 million barrels of oil from from other country reserves. That's for for gas to help to help with gas. The administration has allowed E15, which uses homegrown biofuels, to be sold this summer uh, to help as well. And um, and also he announced administration actions to save hundreds of thousands of families hundreds of dollars per month by fixing the Affordable Care Act's family glitch. So these are the things that he is uh, continuing to to work on uh, and make this a priority. And that's why one of the reasons he wanted. The the American people to hear directly from him, hence the op-ed that came out. Okay. Uh, back on the issue of gun reform, so you, you mentioned the limitations that the president is facing. He also has yeah, been he blunt. said this yesterday that, himself. That there's only so much that he can do. That, that much of this is in, in the hands of Congress. But in Texas over the weekend, the president came face to face with a crowd that was demanding that he act, chanting "Do something," and the president said, "We will." Given the limitations that he is facing, how can he make that promise? What makes him so confident that this time around will be different? So, you know, as I've said, our team is in close contact with uh, key members of Congress on negotiations. Uh, and when the president is, is, when it's helpful, he will certainly engage. Uh, but look, this, what we're talking about, is 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 popular is something that the constituents want right when you think about 88 percent support background checks on all gun sales just eight percent oppose when you think about 84 percent support a ban on fire firearm sales to people reported as dangerous to law enforcement just nine percent oppose 69 percent of support banning high capacity magazine just 22 percent oppose 67 percent oppose banning assault style weapons just 25 percent oppose this is 
from a poll last week from Politico Morning Consult. Uh, Reuters uh, had a poll as well on that same day. 84% support background checks for all firearm sales. 70% 70, 70 uh, uh, support red flag laws. So these are things that if you think about uh, these, the senators and congressional members, these are things that their own constituents uh, support. And so what the president is going to continue to do, as he's done from the first day that he walked, first few days that he walked into uh, office, is to ask Congress to act. And so we're going to continue to have those conversations. He's going to do everything that he can uh, to make that happen. We have to stop this gun violence epidemic that we're seeing. But these measures have been popular for some time. I mean, that, that's not new to this most recent yeah. massacre. So what is the president seeing, if anything, that makes him confident that this time will be different? I mean, we've heard him say that he thinks uh, everyone's getting more rational about this. What is, has he seen from Republicans that, that gives him that sense? Well, right now, as we know, there are uh, bipartisan negotiations happening today. Uh, it may have happened already. I know there was supposed to be a Zoom call uh, that was being led uh, by, uh, by uh, Chris Murphy. Uh, and so, you know, it is important. That's what we want to see. We want to see steps being taken uh, so that we can get to a resolution, a solution here. Uh, we cannot uh, continue uh, having this epidemic that we're having, uh, which gun violence. This is not okay. And what we're asking Congress to do is to vote. Vote again. I said, I just said this. Vote to protect our communities. Vote to protect our children. Vote to protect our teachers. Vote to be able so that people can safely go into a grocery store and not worry about being killed. And uh, so the president's going to continue to speak to this. Uh, he's going to continue to use, uh, you know, the, the the platform that he has. But again, he has done more on executive action in his first year than any other president has, uh, in particular at this point. How would you gauge his level of confidence that that vote is actually going to happen? Look, we're going to continue to try. I cannot, you know, I can't speak to how people are feeling in Congress. That's something that they have to answer or where they are with the process. What we're going to do is do our job from here and having those conversations. Uh, as I mentioned, his team is talking to folks on the other side about negotiations, uh, and we're going to continue to call for action. Can we come back to the back? I'm right here. Thank you so much. I have a BTS question and also a Taiwan oh, question. A BTS question. <laughs> yeah, okay. first, first of all, um, they've been here for a few hours, just wondering if they're filming a music video on site or anything oh. like that. And also, <laughs> any um, substantive policy recommendations to the president about combating discrimination and hate crime? Well, uh, right after right after they were here, they did go to meet with the president. Clearly, I don't know what conversation was had. Um, so uh, usually, we try to keep those private conversation private. Um, you heard from from them directly about how this important it was for them uh, to use their platform to be here to talk about issues that matter to them, uh, in particular the uh, anti -hate, Asian hate that we have seen across this country these past uh, few years. And so uh, this was an important moment for them. Uh, I spoke to them before they came out. Uh, they were uh, they were th they were thrilled to come out and and make sure that you heard directly from them why they were here. Uh, I, I don't have much more to share share as you know they're they're having a meeting right now with the president. So moving on to Taiwan, Senator Duckworth is in Taiwan today and China has sent 30 overflights to Taiwan is this seen as a threatening move and um, can you just illuminate you know what 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 Senator Duckworth is doing over there, what the point of this mission is. Yeah, I cannot speak for Senator Duckworth. You would have to um, reach out to her office. I, I don't have anything to say on, on why she's there. Something you see as threatening. It's something that we're monitoring. Uh, I don't have any comment on, on that at this time. But clearly, these are things that we, we keep an eye on. Can I ask you a question from the back? Okay. Thank you so much. The President said yesterday that he believes Senator McConnell is a rational Republican. Senator McConnell said today that the group of lawmakers that are talking about guns in the wake of Uvalde are talking about the problem, which is, quote, mental illness and school safety. Does the President agree that that's the problem here? So, look, when the President said that, um, he believes that there are some uh, rational Republicans uh, in the Senate who can come together and work on a bipartisan bill. 
Um, and uh, Mitch McConnell is one of those uh, is one of those folks. He does not believe, uh, and we've talked about this. He's talked about this. Uh, you know, we are the only country uh, that is dealing with gun violence at the rate that we're dealing. And other countries have mental health issues. So what's the problem here? Um, and so the problems is the problem is what with, is with guns and not having uh, and not having legislation to really deal with an issue uh, that is a pandemic here in this country. Uh, and so uh, you, you know that is that is not his focus, uh, obviously. And uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to schools and and I don't know what he said specifically about about schools. I know there's been. Uh, conversation about hardening schools. That is not something that he believes in. He believes that we should be able to to give uh, teachers the resources to be able to do the job uh, that they're meant to do at schools. Um, and this is something that uh, he's been focusing on uh, since he was a vice, vice president. So those are two things that he does not agree on. Uh, but look, he thinks there's a way uh, to potentially have, uh, potentially come for, for uh, senators to come together um, and Congress to come together. They should, they need to act. Uh, and that's what he's gonna, he's gonna continue to call for. Even though he disagrees with the top Republican in the Senate on what the problem is here. I mean, look, I think that what the president is going to continue to do um, is call for Congress to take action, uh, is to call for Congress uh, to move forward and deal with this epidemic that we're seeing across this country. And, uh, and so he's going to leave it up to Congress to do that. He's going to step in when needed. But again, our office, our office here is in regular contact on negotiations. And you just said that the president will get engaged with Congress on these talks when he believes it's helpful. Does he believe it's helpful right now for him to be involved directly in these negotiations? When, when the time comes, he will get involved. He, he spoke to this yesterday. Uh, what we're going to continue to do is call on Congress to act. Uh, and again, our office, uh, our uh, offices here, our different departments here are in, in constant communications and, and uh, with the negotiation process that's happening. Karen, can you confirm that the President yeah, Chief of Staff Ron Clay is taking yeah, his position after the midterms? Can no, you confirm yeah, that? No. Can I ask you a second question? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, um, a follow up on the long range rockets question. Does the United States not want Ukraine to launch attacks into Russian territory, despite the fact that Russia is obviously launching attacks on it? I mean, the president spoke to this yesterday. I don't have anything more to, to add. First of all, we don't have, uh, it's being, it's under consideration. I don't have anything more to to, um, to say to that, but again, you know, we won't be sending long-range rockets for use beyond the battlefield in Ukraine. So the president answered that yesterday. Switching gears to gun control and yeah. to the meeting with the New Zealand Prime Minister today, the president mentioned what New Zealand has done on this issue. What does he think, or what does the White House think, the United States can learn from New Zealand on guns? Look, I I think they had a very good meeting. Um, they clearly spoke about gun reform. Um, in, his, uh, in, in the meeting, he actually wanted to talk more about what uh, the New Zealand Prime Minister uh, has done uh, on, on gun reform in her, in, in her country. Uh, and so he wanted to hear more about that. Uh, I don't have anything more to read out, but it, it is something that, it, an agenda item that came up. Uh, in their meetings, and uh, you know he's always o open to listen. Uh, but then again, you know I have to, we have to just remember um, that we we need to act. Congress needs to act. It is the time to act now, um, and that's what the president's going to continue to call for. Uh, you know it, it is um, it is something that he has worked on since he was a senator, as a vice president, uh, and now as president, uh, he has taken action. Uh, as as a president, uh, to make sure he can do everything that he can uh, to to address uh, gun violence, and now he's calling on Congress uh, to deal with um, you know banning uh, the banning of assault weapons, uh, and also uh, ex uh, and also background checks, expanding expanding background checks. Those are things that they can they can do. It's popular. I just laid out the polling and what the polling sh showed. This is what their constituents want them to do, is to act. And so that's what we're going to keep calling on them to do. Good.
thanks, Rain. Uh, uh, following up on Keelan's question about the president's involvement, you said he would en engage when he found when he thinks it would be helpful. Does he think it would be unhelpful right now for him to engage in, in those negotiations? No. Um, what we're what he what we're trying to say is that there are conversations happening right now. Right. There's a Zoom call, a bipartisan uh, conversation happening right now. Uh, so we're going to let that process go. Uh, we're going to, but at the same time, we're going to continue to call for action. Um, you know, it's you know he directed his team uh, to look at ad additional ways uh, for executive action. So that doesn't stop from us on our end. Uh, but he can't do it alone, and that's what we keep trying to say here. He, we, Congress needs to take their step to make action. And then just one follow up again on the comment that he made about their rational Republicans as a candidate on the presidential campaign trail. He often said Republicans would have an epiphany after uh, Trump was uh, defeated that they would come to their senses. In his words, and work with Democrats on certain issues. Um, many Democrats that you talk to say that that is an outdated view of the modern Senate. That the partisanship has increased significantly. Do you? Does he still believe that there are ten Republican senators willing to vote on some measure of gun reform? Um, there's criticism that that is uh, the view that Mitch McConnell and others are rational Republicans, given Mitch McConnell's long and, and well-documented history of blocking any sort of vote on gun control throughout his leadership of the Republican Party. What we're saying is that's what their constituents want them to do. That is what, uh, we, regardless if you're a Republican or independent or Democrat, we, you have a, a bipartisan opinion out there uh, from constituencies, from American families, uh, from the American public that wants Congress to act. Ninety percent of gun owners support universal background checks. That's ninety percent. Eighty-four percent of Republicans and eighty percent of NRA members support background checks. That's what we know. That's what the data shows us. That's what we need to do uh, is for them to act so that we can uh, make sure that our communities are protected, that we save our communities, that our children are not uh, going into going to school feeling unsafe. So that's what we need to make sure. What is what does the president think the reason is that Republicans are not voting for some of these bills? If you're saying they're widely popular, um, what is the where does the president believe the the disconnect is between the Republican leaders. That's, and, and that's for them to answer. They have to. They have to answer to their constituents. Not. I just laid out what the constitu their constituents wants to see. That's for them to answer. That's that's a question that they need to go to uh, their constituents and, and answer why they haven't moved forward on, on on common sense gun violence reform. That's what we're asking for. Um, this is a question I was hoping to get to Brian Deese, but I'm hoping you can help us understand as well. Um, you know, earlier today, Larry Summers told the Washington Post essentially that a soft landing seems, you know, in his views, particularly unlikely. And we heard Brian suggest, I think, a rather rosy picture of being able to move out of this inflationary period. I guess I want to understand from you all what makes you so confident that a soft landing is possible, and should we be anticipating as a public? that there will be a rocky economic period coming forward. I mean, I guess I just want to understand what makes you all think. I, look, you, you know, and this is what Brian D set up here, and I think he would say the same thing to this question, is that we are, we are doing everything that we can uh, to deal with uh, what the American public is, is uh, currently have in front of them, right, with these high price, with high gas prices uh, and inflation. And we are taking every step uh, that we can, taking this very seriously uh, to make sure that we bring uh, down inflation and we deal with inflation in a way that the American public feels this. And we feel that if we are able to do that, continue to with the four steps that the President talked about in his, in his op-ed today, uh, that we will get to a place uh, that, uh, that, where, that, uh, w that where, where the prices can come down and we can deal with inflation in a real way. And so I guess, you know, the, the outlook, though, is that a recession, when you look at inflation historically at this level, a recession is naturally followed, he would say, within two years. And so why would this, why would this time be any different? Well, I, you know, as, as we have said, we're dealing with a transition, right? We are, we're, we're, we just, we're coming out of, or coming, uh, we're dealing with a, um, a, um, a, a, an economy uh, that has really bounced back. 
eight, more than 8.5 million jobs have been created. We've seen unemployment go down. And now we're in the transition period where we're going to be in a place where it's more stable and more steady. And so that is kind of, that is our focus. That's where we are currently. And uh, that's, that's where we're going to be moving forward to. Final question. I'll, I'll take one question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, gunman suspects in both Buffalo and Texas uh, were 18 years old. Uh, would the president's support or be open to raising the minimum age for purchasing a gun uh, to 21 years old? This is something that Congressman uh, Kinzinger, a Republican, uh, said would be a no-brainer on Sunday. And so it seems like something that would have maybe out of the gate some bipartisan support. Does the president support that? Well, I'll let the president's words speak for himself. He just he said last week that um, an 18 year old should not be able uh, to be purchasing a gun, uh, a, an assault weapon uh, that we saw this 18 year old do in, um, in, in Texas. And so I'll just let his words speak, stand for itself. And so he just signed such a bill into law for capacity. I'll just, again, I'll just let his words stand for himself, for itself. I'll take I'll take one more. I'll take one more. Um, on the rocket systems, can you talk at all about how did the U.S. balance the need to help Ukraine without putting the country at risk of a direct conflict with Russia? I mean, again, I we don't have anything to announce at this time. Uh, what the president said is stands uh, as of today. I don't have anything more. It's under consideration. Uh, I just don't have more to share on that. Have guns, Karina. Uh, yes. On Saturday, gun control advocates are marching in, in D.C. and cities around the country. Will the president take? Uh, Part in these gun control events in any way? Wait, can you say that again? I, I missed the first part. Life is doing oh, an event in okay. DC and around the country on Saturday. Will be uh, this coming Saturday? Saturday? Yes. Yeah. Or it's Saturday. Yeah. And um, is it Saturday the 11th? I'm sorry, I might have my dates. June 11th. He's doing it on June 11th. Will the president take part in this in any way? I, I don't have anything to preview for you about his schedule this this weekend. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.